Welcome to Peer-to-Peer -peer Bullying and Harassment in Schools, School Responsibilities and Liability Exposure. My name is Elka Sachs, and with me is Allison Bellinger. We are both members of the Charter School Practice here at Krakitis and Bluestein. Krakitis and Bluestein has represented charter schools since the first charter schools formed in 1995. We are also honored to represent the Massachusetts Charter Public School Association, today's host. We have a full service charter school practice, including governance, state ethics, contracting, public procurement, real estate acquisition and development, finance, employment and labor law, special education and discipline. Our focus today will be peer-to-peer -peer bullying and harassment in schools, focusing on school responsibilities and liability exposure, and the steps that schools can take to protect the school the students and employees. Before Allison and I begin dis to discuss content, I'm going to share a couple of quick notes about the webinar process for those of you who aren't familiar. A copy of our slides will be emailed to you after the presentation. If you have questions at any point, you can type them into the questions box on your screen at any time during the presentation. We will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Your questions will only be visible to me and Allison. They are not visible to other webinar participants. Feel free to share your name in the school when you ask your questions, but if you prefer to remain anonymous, please let us know. So about this presentation, we're gonna start with a brief introduction to peer-to-peer -peer harassment and bullying. We're gonna talk about the special education implications move on to a discussion of notifying parents, the requirements, restrictions, and guidance, uh, then talk about notifying law enforcement, and wrap up with peer-to-peer -peer sexual harassment and assault, both the Mass recent Massachusetts precedents and how to respond. So by way of introduction, there are a number of, of uh, legal regimes that govern this area of law. These include the Massachusetts Bullying Statute, Federal IDEA and Section 504, Federal Title II of the ADA, Massachusetts Student Records Regulations, and Federal Title IX. A couple of key definitions are listed here. I don't want to run through them in their entirety because they are quite long, um, but bullying is defined in the Massachusetts Bullying Statute. Uh, and it means the repeated use by one or more students of written, verbal, or electronic expression or a physical act or gesture um, that is directed at a victim that causes physical or emotional harm to the victim or damage to the victim's property, places the victim in reasonable fear of harm to himself or damage to his property, creates a hostile environment at school for the victim, infringes on the rights of the victim at school, or materially and substantially disrupts the educational process or orderly operation of the school. Now, bullying also includes cyberbullying. I am not gonna read through that definition. Um, it's, it tries to include every means by which bullying can be conducted technologically, trying to take into account the fact that technology changes over time, which is why it's quite long. Uh, a couple of definitions um, that are used in Title IX. Uh, one is gender-based harassment, um, which is the unwelcome conduct based on a student's sex, uh, harassing conduct based on a student's failure to conform to sex stereotypes, and sexual harassment, um, which is defined as unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature and includes sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature. Sexual violence is a form of sexual harassment prohibited by Title IX. Now, understand that these definitions are not found in Title IX themselves. Title IX uses those terms. These definitions I took from the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights website yesterday. And the reason why I noted that it's yesterday is because these definitions um, may be revised in the future under proposed regulations. Um, I've also included a definition of sexual violence, um, which includes sexual assault, rape, sexual battery, sexual abuse, sexual coercion. Uh, again, this is not defined in Title IX, 
uh, cases will define um, uh, these terms. These terms have also been defined in Dear Colleague letters issued by the Office of Civil Rights, but subsequently archived because um, these definitions are undergoing review. Um, but this is the definition you'll find on the OCR website. So I'm going to turn to Allison now to talk about the special education implications of peer-to-peer -peer harassment. Sure. So. A school has several responsibilities when bullying involves a student who has been deemed eligible for special education services. So the first question you want to ask when, when you're alerted to an incident of peer-to-peer -peer harassment or assault is whether the target or the aggressor are eligible for special education services. If either or both of them are identified as eligible, then you have to take a few different steps. Your first step should be assessing compliance with various regulations, including the Massachusetts bullying statute, the Massachusetts special education rules, and the federal individuals with disabilities and education act rules. So we'll start with the bullying, what the bullying statute requires. If a student has been deemed eligible for special education services and is involved in a bullying incident, then you want to look to the student's IEP and, and see whether it addresses the skills and proficiencies needed to avoid and respond to bullying harassment. Now you need to do this if the student's IEP indicates that he or she has a disability that impacts his or her social skills development, or if his or her disability makes him or her vulnerable to bullying, harassment, or teasing, or if he or she is on the autism spectrum. So once you look to the IEP uh, and determine whether those skills and proficiencies are there, if necessary, you have to convene an IEP team to address any missing deficiencies. And to determine whether and to determine whether the proficiencies are there or what needs to be there, Desi has promulgated a list of recommended questions that you should be asking yourself involving, for example, safety and whether the student feels safe at school. And if not, why not? Desi recommends that you consider questions related to awareness. So is the school aware that the student is being a target of bullying? Or do, are the parents aware of it? Do, are the parents aware of other instances where the student has been bullied? When and where do those occur? Desi also recommends that you assess the student's vulnerability. So whether the student displays any particular traits, verbal or nonverbal, that make him or her more vulnerable to bullying. Desi also recommends that you look to see whether the student, him or herself, has actually engaged in behavior that might be identified as bullying. So whether he or she has been an aggressor and whether there's a concern that any new or emerging behavior might be identified in this way. Desi also recommends that you look to see whether the, the you look to determine whether the student is able to access the general education curriculum, which should include your bullying prevention and intervention curriculum. You should also be looking to the student's skills, so whether the student has sufficient self-advocacy skills to help, to obtain help, know what to do if he or she is bullied, and whether the, and what particular skills the student needs to develop a guard against becoming a target of bullying or stopping aggressive behavior that's directed toward him or her. There are several other questions. I'm not going to go into them in great detail, but you should be looking at the student's social status, you know, whether he or she has a close friend group that could help in these situations, whether the student has a safe person that he or she feels comfortable going to, to with issues, whether there's an aid you can, you can give to the student to assist at particular times of day, and, and whether particular times of day um, lead to the student being more vulnerable, such as lunch or recess, free periods like that and whether the student, whether a behavior intervention plan is in place or whether one's appropriate to help the student. So then the Massachusetts bullying, so then you also want to assess compliance with the Massachusetts special ed regulations, which require a couple of things. So they require that the initial evaluation includes an assessment of the child's relationships with groups, peers, and adults. And you need to consider whether a re-evaluation is necessary, even if it's prior to the three-year mark. And then finally, you want to assess compliance with the federal regulations under the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, which requires, again, a couple of things. The idea requires that a child who's eligible for special ed services be assessed in all areas related to the suspected disability, which could include, if appropriate, social and emotional status. And you need to consider whether the initial assessment was adequate or whether additional assessments are necessary. So after you assess compliance with all of those rules, you should check the student's IEP for whether to see whether modifications or changes are necessary. 
So for example, does the IEP include all supports that students need, that the student needs in order to develop necessary social skills? So for example, you might consider putting in place a supplementary aid to monitor the student during certain periods, like, like lunch, recess, study hall, or on the bus. You should look to see whether school staff needs to be informed about the student's needs. And it, it's not just teachers, whether the guidance counselor should be informed, or the school nurse, or the or cafeteria workers, or bus drivers. You could do things like identify a home base and a safe adult to whom the student can go to when feeling vulnerable or targeted. And you can develop a safety plan, which includes regular check-ins or making sure that environment adjustments are made if necessary. You can put together scripts for the student to respond to particular situations. You could do things like consider changing the aggressor seats or, rather than the targets. Um, and, and provide opportunities to practice any safety plans or, or changes like that. You might also consider offering additional counseling or offering skill building supports to allow the student to prevent or respond to bullying. You can, for, for example, you can put the student in a communication skills or a social pragmatics skills group. And then finally, another thing you can consider is whether you should conduct or revisit a functional behavioral assessment and a behavioral intervention plan that might identify certain behaviors and antecedents to those behaviors in order to teach students to reduce or avoid problematic behaviors. And then finally, IDEA requires that when the team convenes, the team must consider that this, whether the student has been involved in any bullying incidents. And the team has to use that information to inform its discussion of the student's needs. So once you're done it, doing that, you, you need to consider whether the bullying constitutes discrimination or discriminatory peer harassment based on disability. Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 could be violated if either the disability is sufficiently severe, persistent, or pervasive and creates a hostile environment by interfering with or denying the student's participation in or receipt of benefits, of benefits services, and opportunities, and whether such harassment has been encouraged, tolerated, or, or not adequately addressed by school employees. If you merely follow your anti-bullying policy, you might realize that you're, you're not taking steps to recognizing and addressing discriminatory harassment. Failure to recognize and address discriminatory harassment can include, can it lead to remedies that include administrative due process procedures, complaints to the Office of Civil Rights of the uh, Federal Department of Education, or com other complaints perhaps to the board or our teachers. And then if you do learn that uh, disability harassment has occurred, you should take steps to investigate promptly and respond appropriately. And we will discuss that in greater detail with respect to sexual harassment and sexual assault because that those are, we're seeing a lot of harassment of that nature. Um, so we'll address that in more detail later. And then finally, you should consider whether the federal IDEA requirements are met. Disability harass, if a student's being harassed based on his or her disability, it might be considered a denial of free appropriate public education in violation of IDEA. And as you probably know, remedies for failure to provide faith include administrative complaints, complaints to OCR, or complaints to the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. All right, at this point, we're gonna talk a little bit about the requirements of uh, notice to parents in the event of a bullying uh, uh, incident, um, the restrictions on notifying parents and also additional guidance offered by DESI in specific situations. All right, so what are the requirements? If the principal determines that bullying or re retaliation has occurred, um, the school is required to notify the parents or guardians. Um, of both the perpetrator um, who gets, whose parents get notice of the incident and also um, the parents or guardians of the target whose parents get both notice of the incident and notice of efforts taken to prevent bullying and retaliation. But that notice um, needs to be consistent with law and we're, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and what restrictions that imposes. And the notice in each case needs to be given in uh, the primary language of the home. Um, notice must be made promptly following the determination, um, but may also be given before the determination is made. 
So what are the restrictions in notifying parents? Well, firstly, um, you must consider that um, students over the age of 18 are permitted to limit their parents' access to their student records, um, other than the right to actually physically inspect the record. And so if the target or the aggressor is over the age of 18, the school should check uh, the uh, parent's right of access to notice. Most importantly, a school may not share one student's record with the parents of the other student. So accordingly, when notice of bullying is made, the school should avoid identifying the other child or children involved. Um, and that can be really difficult because in particular, the parents of the target are likely to want to know who did this to my child and want to know what punishment or discipline has been needed against the other children. And that is part of their student record. And what you need to focus on in notifying parents is what is being done to help their child, not what's being done to the other children. Uh, the other thing to consider is access by non-custodial parents. Now, we don't have time to review the details of providing access to student records to parents who do not have physical custody, but just keep in mind um, that these rules likely apply to bullying reports as to any other student record, and feel free to get in touch with any questions. In terms of special guidance, so DESI recognizes that special circumstances that ap apply when a, an LGBT student has been bullied. The student might not have told his or her parents about his or her sexual orientation or gender identity and, ex and expression and may be concerned about sharing this information. Um, that concern might make the student less willing to report bullying or participate in a bullying investigation. So the school has to approach the situation very thoughtfully. The sh school should also be aware that a heterosexual student might also be concerned about his or her parents' reaction if the student was targeted based on perceived sexual orientation or gender expression and identity. And the DESI guidance that I'll, I'll be talking about really applies to both situations. Um, DESI recommends that in this situation, an individual communication plan should be developed for each such circumstance in consultation with the student uh, who has been bullied, guidance staff, and a designated person proficient in these topics um, if the school does not have uh, such a person as a member of its guidance staff. In other words, the, student, the, uh, the school might need to reach outside of the school community to find somebody to assist. The communications plan should be based on an assessment of the student's safety, along with research and resources that might be provided to support the student and his or her parents. School officials should use discretion about uh, and avoid sharing details that might endanger the student's physical or mental well-being. And the cultural implications of the discussion should be considered. It's really important to keep in mind that if the student's parents um, are not uh, English speakers or English is not their primary language and an interpreter is needed, don't use the student to act as interpreter. Now, DESI doesn't provide similar guidance with respect to other sensitive disclosures, and we have had um, situations where a bullying incident was sensitive in the context of the particular student and his or her cultural background. Um, in an example would be um, situations involving sexual assault, where there are no LGBT implications. We do recommend that school officials approach those communications with the same level of sensitivity to the parents' cultural background and response, but be aware that there's no special DESI guidance that allows you to limit the disclosure in those circumstances. So we're going to move on now to uh, notifying law enforcement. And Allison, if you could take over. Sure. So not only do you have to notify parents when there are uh, incidents of bullying, in certain circumstances, you also have to notify law enforcement. So the, then this is prescribed by the Massachusetts Bullying Statute, which requires that 
once the school principal or his or her designee determines that bullying or retaliation occurs, that person, either the principal or his or her designee, must notify law enforcement if the school principal or his or her designee believes that criminal charges may be pursued against the aggressor. So that comes from the statute. And then the Massachusetts bullying regulations attempt to operationalize this requirement, which require that on the first day, or they provide rather, that on the first day of each school year, the school leader speaks with the local chief of police or his or her designee about the best way to implement these rules, including an agreed upon, agreed upon method of notification and informal communication. The regulations also modify the statutory notice requirements to a degree. So for example, the regulations state that notice to a law enforcement is required if the principal or designee has a reasonable basis to believe that criminal charges may be pursued against the aggressor. Second, the regulations provide that notice to law enforcement must be consistent with the requirements of the Massachusetts student record regulation. And the Massachusetts student record regulations requires notice to appropriate parties in connection with health or safety emergencies if it's necessary to protect the health or safety of students or other individuals. And third, notice the regulations provide that notice is not required when bullying and retaliation may be handled within the school. In making this de determination, the principal or de the designee is permitted to consult with the school resource officer and others. Schools should be sure not to, should not fail to contact law enforcement when necessary um, for the health and safety of student or other individuals, but should realize that notice is not mandatory in all circumstances. And then we also wanted to take this moment to remind schools of the special obligation under the charter school regulations to notify DESE of all significant matters. And significant matters is defined to include all communication with law enforcement or other investigative agencies. So if you were to bring in law enforcement, or if you were to notify law enforcement of a bullying incident, that would trigger the special DESE reporting obligation. This is, off, this is an often overlooked requirement, um, but we've helped schools in the past put together notices for this purpose. And then, so from here, we're gonna shift a little bit and, and Elka is going to talk to you a bit about peer-to-peer -peer sexual harassment, which is something we've been seeing a lot of lately. So thank you, Allison. Um, when we look to see um, which cases, Massachusetts cases, uh, involved a claim under the bullying statute, we noticed that most involved sexual harassment or assault. So this has been consistent with our experience where many of the serious bullying issues brought to our attention concern sexual harassment and assault. In this next section, we will begin by looking at claims that have been allowed to proceed against schools and their employees in connection with peer-to-peer -peer sexual harassment and assault, and the steps that schools might take to protect themselves their employees and their students in similar circumstances. So the first case we're gonna look at is um, Harrington versus the city of Attleboro. This is a 2016 case, and I'll give you a little background. Um, over a four year period, the student was taunted and bullied, often using sexually derogatory language and description of body size. The taunts and bullying appear to have begun with one classmate spread to his friend and then to the friends of that friend. There was some physical assault, but it was not sexual in nature. The student's mother found a Facebook post from the student wondering whether the bullying classmates would regret it if she committed suicide. The school said there was nothing it could do and that professional help was needed. The student's pediatrician sent her to a crisis center, which told the mother that she could not attend that school, and the student was then enrolled in a day treatment center for psychotherapeutic care. Ultimately, the mother and the student sued the school system. Their Title IX claim for failure to protect the student against sexual harassment was allowed to go forward, and ultimately the case settled. Um, which is what typically happens when claims are allowed to go forward. Uh, so we are not, I think we've tried to get this settlement agreement. Uh, I know in the past we've, we've also been unable to get settlement agreements. Um, and so we can't see what the nature of the settlement was. Um, but the fact that there was a settlement indicates that uh, 
that the school system did um, provide some compensation to the student and family. Of note in this case, the comments regarding the student's body size and physical characteristics were considered to be based on sexual st stereotyping and therefore recognizable under Title IX. Um, although school employees took some action, considering how long the harassment persisted, which was over four years, and that many of the bullies were repeat offenders, the court said it was plausible to allege that school employees were deliberately indifferent to the fact that their remedies had been ineffective. So what are the takeaways? Um, in considering appropriate measures to address bullying, schools must consider both the length of time that a student has been bullied, four years is a long time, and the school should also consider that when bullying is conducted repeatedly by the same individuals, it indicates that the measures taken by the school to prevent the bullying have been inadequate. All right, the next case, Thomas versus the town of Chelmsford is a 2017 case. And this is one of the most horrific of these situations. Um, in this case, the situation only resolved when the student transferred to a different school and repeated the grade. Um, very specifically, the student who was on an IEP <clears throat> and his parents had, been, had filed a complaint with the school that he was subject to bullying, uh, but then that, that escalated to extreme bullying and physical assaults, including a rape with a broom handle at a school-sponsored football camp, followed by continued bullying and harassment in person and through social media by both students and teachers who ridiculed the student for speaking with the police and the school administrators. During the year, the court noted that the parents and student made 24 complaints to administrators and spoke with the police and district attorney, and the situation did not resolve. The legal case brought by the parents is a catalog of claims brought against a large pool of defendants, the town of Chelmsford, the school committee, the school superintendent, the principal, the dean, the athletics director, the head coach, and three teachers. The case is instructive in explaining when claims might go forward and when they are likely to be dismissed. Ultimately, like the previous case we discussed and many others of this nature, the case settled. So what are some of the takeaways from this case? Well, the first is that the school needs to protect students against repeat assaults. Uh, in this case, the student was not able to bring what we call a due process claim that the school had an obligation to protect bodily integrity because he could not demonstrate that the school had actual knowledge that he was in clear, obvious, and present peril uh, before the assault and that the state's actions shocked the conscience. However, the outcome might have been different if there was a repeat of the sexual assaults, given that no effort appears to have been taken to prevent recurrence. So it is important for schools to consider the circumstances of an initial assault and ensure that these circumstances are not repeated. A second takeaway, instruct teachers to respond appropriately. Although the student was not able to bring a due process claim, he was able to bring a federal First Amendment retaliation claim. Um, the complaints made by the parents and the student were considered to be constitutionally protected speech. Because their teachers harassed the student as a result of his complaint of sexual assault to the police, the, the First Amendment retaliation claim was permitted to stand. And so the takeaway here, again, is even if the original incident didn't create liability for the teachers, the manner in which they handled the situation might. Teachers might need instructions regarding their conduct following a peer-to-peer -peer incident. It might seem obvious that they may not harass a student, but teachers might need protocols and training. They should be told explicitly not to take sides and that they should avoid initiating discussion regarding the incident unless they are participating in the school's official investigation or response. Next takeaway is to follow a uniform standards and protocols to address sexual harassment and assault. In this case, the parents and student were not able to describe a comparable situation which had been handled differently. However, if they could, they might have been able to state an equal protection claim. The takeaway is, again, schools should establish 
standards for addressing peer-to-peer -peer incidents and follow them regardless of gender, the identity of the student, or the nature of the claim. Next takeaway, respond to every complaint. The parents and students acknowledge that the administration did respond to the teacher's retaliatory comments in this case and only question the adequacy of, this, of the response. Um, that didn't satisfy the requirement of deliberate indifference, which would have allowed them to bring a supervisory liability of individual defendants claim. Um, even if the supervisor's response was, uh, was inadequate to prevent future harassment, it was sufficient to protect them from liability for this type of claim. And so schools need to know that you need to take steps in response to every complaint. Next takeaway, keep an eye on unwritten po school policies and customs. The parents and student alleged that the school committee had a practice of not applying its bullying policies and looking the other way from sexual misconduct and sexual har harassment by star athletes. The takeaway, even when the written policy is adequate, a school's unwritten policies and customs can result in liability. Next takeaway, the Title IX claim was allowed because the harassment came in different forms from different students over an extended period of time. As we discussed earlier, the length of time um, is important in determining whether there's harassment um, that allows a Title IX claim to go forward. A student who leaves school has a stronger claim. That's another takeaway. Uh, if, uh, according to the court, uh, because the, it was alleged that the teachers ridiculed the student in front of others, um, it, it was plausible that they intimidated him and caused him to leave school. And that allowed a claim to be brought under the Massachusetts Civil Rights Act for deprivation of education. So in this case, again, a child who left school, particularly to attend private school as a result of a school-related matter, um, had grounds under the Massachusetts Civil Rights Act. Another takeaway, although the top, today's topic is peer-to-peer -peer harassment and assault, keep in mind that teachers may also be personally liable for their response. In this case, the teachers, um, the claim against the teachers for intentional infliction of emotional distress and loss of a consortium, meaning harm to the parental relationship, was allowed to go forward against the individual teachers who ridiculed the student for reporting the assault. And the last takeaway is keep an eye on school culture. Uh, in this case, a claim was allowed to go forward despite the Massachusetts Tort Claims Act, which normally says that claims cannot be brought against a municipality for the actions of third parties. In this case, the, the plaintiffs allege that the town's sports culture um, uh, or, and customs uh, as well as the individual defendant's treatment of the student, meaning the teacher's treatment, was the original cause that emboldened others to bully the student. So the town was responsible for the school's culture and that allowed them to be liable under the Massachusetts Tort Claims Act, although municipalities, as I said, are normally not uh, liable for the acts of third parties. And so the last case uh, that I'm going to talk about is from last year. It's Lopez versus City of Somerville. Uh, and I'll let, just let you know the, out, the uh, outcome at the moment is that it's under appeal. Uh, in this situation, um, there are some similarities actually to the previous case. Uh, it also concerned a, a, an incident at a, a school-sponsored athletics camp. Uh, where the child was raped um, with a broom handle. Uh, in this case, the student appears not to have been the target of bullying prior to attendance at camp, uh, and the incident was described as a hazing incident. The school responded to the report by filing a 51A report with the Department of Children and Families, notifying the state police, enlisting the city's trauma response network and the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, revising its code of conduct and conducting an assembly to discuss the assaults and hazing. The school conducted weekly check-in, I'm sorry, regular check-ins of the student uh, and offered an escort between classes, which was declined. However, this, despite all these responses, the student was taunted and bully, bullied for the remainder of his high school career. Uh, these incidents happened in the freshman year. So this is again, a four-year incident. 
The coach and other staff were aware of the taunting and bullying and reported it to the athletics director. The athletics director reported it to the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, which did provide additional staff at playoff games, but did not follow up with a student or report the continued taunting and bullying to the superintendent. Um, but like I said, the coaches did respond to each instance by ensuring that a fields administrator was present at every game to protect the student and by speaking with the MIAA and other schools athletics directors. So initially, the Title IX claim of, uh, of hostile environment was allowed to go forward um, based on the fact that the athletics director really didn't respond appropriately. However, there was a motion brought for reconsideration, and a couple months after the original decision to allow the Title IX claim to go forward, the federal district court determined that because the athletics uh, I'm sorry, the, it was, uh, the initial ruling was in June, and then in October, uh, almost a year ago, the federal district court determined that because the coaches did act appropriately, even though their supervisor, the athletics director did not, the Title IX claim would be barred. So this case remains on appeal, and we really don't know how it's going to turn out, but it's fairly, uh, apparently fact-specific. The takeaway is that teachers and administrators alike must be trained to intervene in cases of harassment and bullying. Uh, in this case, it might be that the school will, will be protected from liability because of the actions of the lower tier staff, even when the administrator did not act appropriately, but we really don't know what the outcome will be uh, on appeal. And so, moving on to Allison, we're going to talk now, or Allison's going to talk now, about how to respond, uh, just sort of your basic practical guidance. Sure. So, I'll be speaking specifically about how to respond to instances of sexual harassment and assault, but you'll see that a lot of these can be applied in non-sexual harassment and assault uh, instances as well. So as you all probably know, your first, your main priority is the safety of your students. So before doing anything, you should evaluate whether one or more students require immediate assistance for their health or safety. It may be that you do this out, an, out of an abundance of caution because it may ultimately turn out that sexual or assault, harassment or assault did not occur, but you should still consider whether service, immediate services are necessary. And these could include providing crisis services, either through a school counselor or a school nurse or through community resources. It could include determining whether the student requires help, immediate health care. So for instance, if the student appears injured, you should get treatment for those injuries, or whether you, you want to consider whether the student requires preventative treatment for sexually transmitted diseases. And then you also want to consider whether it's appropriate to contact law enforcement. And this is something that should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, especially if it's being considered prior to the initiation or completion of an investigation. But in any event, you should not let the the lack of a final investigation deter you from contacting law enforcement if it's necessary for the health or safety of the student. And as I mentioned before, whenever you contact law enforcement, there is that special charter school regulation that requires you also notify DESE. So you should be keep that in mind as well. So from there, you want to launch a prompt, equitable, and thorough in investigation into the allegations of sexual harassment or assault. Because at the very at the at minimum, you need to de decide or determine what actually happened to the extent you're able to. And in, in going through this, you should keep in mind that we understand that schools are not law enforcement agencies, teachers are not detectives. So you might not ultimately get final answers, but you do need to take steps to conduct as thorough an investigation as possible. In terms of timings, Title IX requires that you begin this investigation promptly. But you also need to keep in mind that the Massachusetts bullying statute requires that as soon as a staff member becomes aware of bullying, that staff member must immediately report it to his or her supervisor or to the principal or the designee. And then the Massachusetts bullying statute, like Title IX, requires that you promptly conduct an investigation. And it's, so it's not uncommon that once you begin the investigation, you find yourself in a he said, she said situation. 
it's important to it's important that the school at the very least it's important that you do everything you can to resolve these allegations by conducting as thorough an investigation as possible schools are required to have a title nine coordinate coordinator who are likely who will likely be the best person to conduct these investigations so this this investigation should include steps like interviewing students any student who might have information about it so the alleged victim the alleged perpetrator friends of each of those students teachers who are familiar with the students you should make sure to collect witness statements from those students as well and you should look to see whether there's surveillance footage available that might shed some light on what happened also keep in mind that during the investigation you should remind all witnesses including the alleged victim and the alleged perpetrator that they are not permitted to engage in retaliation while the investigation is ongoing, you should consider whether interim measures are necessary. Interim measures are defined by certain Title IX guidance to be individualized services offered as, offered as appropriate to either or both the reporting and responding parties involved in alleged incidents of sexual misconduct. These could include counseling, extensions of time or other course related adjustments, modifications to class schedules, escort services, restrictions on contact between the parties, leaves of absence, or increased security and monitoring during certain periods. You have to make sure that you do not rely on fixed rules or operating assumptions that tend to favor one party over another. Interim measures should be individualized and appropriate based on all of the information that's gathered during the course of the investigation and should be design designed to avoid depriving any student of his or her education. So even once you conclude the investigation, you need to consider whether ongoing measures are necessary, and that could mean continuing those measures that you put in place during the investigation, offering additional counseling, offering additional academic accommodations, or measures of that sort. And then you should conduct, if appropriate, based on the results of your investigation, a disciplinary hearing. The person who investigates the the Title IX coordinator or the person who investigates the allegations should not be the same person holding the disciplinary hearing because the investigator is an important component of the hearing, whereas the adjudicator, most often the principal, is the person who determines, based on the results of the investigation, whether the student committed the alleged misconduct and whether discipline is warranted, and if so, what discipline. During the course of the disciplinary hearing, you have to offer each party the same meaningful access to any information that's going to be used during the hearing, which includes a final investigation report. This might also include review of witness statements. So you have to really keep an eye out for retaliation because both the alleged victim and the alleged perpetrator are going to know which other students were involved in the investigation. Under Title IX, each party also ha should have the opportunity to respond to the investigation report in writing in advance of the decision and or at the live hearing. Now, the Massachusetts student disciplinary regulations already account for this obligation by requiring the school to give the student the opportunity to present his or her side of the story at the hearing, but you can satisfy this obligation using a twofold approach by also ensuring that as a part of the investigation, you interview the alleged perpetrator and collect a written witness statement from the alleged perpetrator. So at this hearing, the standard of review is something you need to keep in mind. Under current law, you're permitted to use either a preponderance of the evidence standard or a clear and convincing evidence standard, whichever, which is a little bit stricter than preponderance of the evidence, provided that you use the same standard for sexual assault and harassment cases as you do in all other student misconduct cases. And note that if a complainant presents several allegations of misconduct, you must reach a decision using that standard for each and every allegation. This is, a, this is notable because it's a shift from guidance that existed under the Obama administration. Under the Obama administration, schools were directed to use only a preponderance of the evidence standard for Title IX investigations. But under the current Trump administration, schools can decide whether to use the preponderance of the evidence standard or the stricter clear and convincing evidence standard. Again, provided that you use that, the standard uniformly across all misconduct cases. So 
Even thorough investigations can reach standstills and ultimately it might be impossible to determine if the alleged misconduct actually occurred. But again, we understand you're not detectives, you're not law enforcement agencies. But what you do need to consider is whether the student's conduct violated one of your policies or procedures or general standards of conduct. It might not have risen to the level of sexual harassment or assault, or you might not have enough evidence to reach that determination, but you should look to your own internal policies to determine whether the student engaged in some sort of misconduct and whether discipline is warranted. And then finally, I'm gonna go back. And then finally, depending on the results of the investigation and the outcome of the hearing, you should be consider imposing appropriate discipline. And we don't have time today to go into all of the procedures that you must follow when disciplining students, um, but we have presented a, a couple or a few other webinars on that topic that we encourage you to look on our website for. And then finally, you want to decide whether there's anything you can do to prevent future behavior. All of these, so allegations of sexual harassment or assault can be used as learning opportunities for both student, students and staff. So you should consider providing training for students, staff, maybe even families about your standards of conduct, about your grievance procedures, maybe about appropriate social and relationship boundaries, and how to report and recognize sexual misconduct. When doing this, you wanna be really careful about timing though. So for example, if you hold an assembly about this topic while well, rumors are, all, are still abuzz about specific allegations that uh, against a particular student, it may well be subject to increased criticism or retaliation. So you wanna be really careful when deciding when, where, and how to raise these issues with your students. And then finally, um, this is very, comp we just went through a very complicated area of law, but there are several ways you can improve compliance. So for example, you can create a checklist of steps that you can take whenever a student with a disability is involved in a bullying incident. You can also create a checklist of steps you can take whenever a report of bullying is made. And then you, you might also consider creating a checklist of steps you should and or must take when responding to bullying or harassment or assault. All right, at this point, our formal presentation has ended and we'd like to open it up for questions and answers. Um, taking a look, were there any questions have come in? Oh, actually not, but we have some we got some questions in advance, so while you are all thinking about whether you have any questions, we'll run through run, run through some of those. Yes. All right. So somebody asked in advance whether we can just clarify which Massachusetts and federal laws apply to reporting or bullying. Um, do you want me to take this one out there? Yeah, okay. go right ahead. So from a reporting standpoint, our focus today was the Massachusetts bullying statute because that's the law that sets forth the really specific requirements for notice, including notice to parents and notice to law enforcement. But in addition, you have to think about whether you're obligated to file a 51A report to DCF in certain circumstances. Um, now, we don't have time today to go through all of your mandatory reporting obligations, um, but that's something you do want to think about. And then as we talked about, you also want to make sure, uh, you also want to consider in these circumstances whether it's appropriate to contact law enforcement. And if you do that, you have to notify DESE within two business days under that special um, charter school regulation. Okay, so we do have now a handful of uh, questions that have come in online, uh, so we'll try to go to those next. Um, one, one person asked, are there any special things to know in regards to the SPED student uh, uh, who is an aggressor and how to handle that? So I will acknowledge that most of what we, um, what we listed earlier was tilted toward the student being the target, um, but in fact, a lot of these are, um, can be translated into what if the student's the aggressor. In particular, the the uh, whether the IEP um, includes uh, or addresses the skills and professions proficiencies that the student needs to not be a bully. Um, right. You know, is as important as the skills and proficiencies that a student might need um, uh, if he or she uh, is the target. 
uh, and you need to understand whether the student's disability in, um, uh, has impacted uh, social skills development may, um, and uh, also think about whether that child is on the autism spectrum. Um, again, meet, you know, an IEP team meeting might be needed. Uh, and you need to really run through all the questions that we had listed earlier, but just think of how they would apply in those circumstances. So the second, another question that came in was whether we have to tell the victim's parent the name of the aggressor. So it's a good question, but in fact, you're not allowed to tell the victim's parents the parent the name of the aggressor. And this is really tricky on the ground because that's going to be the first question that the victim, victim's parent asks. But the Massachusetts student record regulations prohibit you from revealing the other the, the student record information, including identity, to the victim's parents. So like Elka had said before, when you're talking to the victim's parent, what you really want to, you want to refocus the discussion to be about what you're doing to protect the victim and keep it as far away as possible as from information about the aggressor. Okay. All right, next question. What if a parent contacts law enforcement and not the school? Would the school um, still be responsible for reporting to DASI? Um, and the answer is, if the if, certainly if law enforcement has made contact with the school, which presumably it has, because I'm not sure how you'd know about it otherwise, then absolutely um, you need to contact DASI. Okay. Next question. It feels like some of this is contradictory. We aren't allowed to share student records or response. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in fact, I'll tell you, I skipped a piece of the uh, my prepared introduction where I was starting to say uh, that one reason why we wanted to address this topic is that there are different legal regimes that apply and some of them do not align perfectly. Um, so the, the answer is that you have to, it is a complicated conversation or it can be a difficult conversation. You do have to contact, um, if there's a bullying situation, the parents of the target and the parents of the aggressor you have to have to tell the story of that child um, whose parents you're speaking with and not the story of the other child. Um, and that can be complicated. Similarly, the, the, um, the requirement to notify law enforcement where, where criminal record or criminal charges may be brought. Um, so the bullying regulations try to help operationalize that a little bit, um, but the key is to consider whether or not there's a health or safety issue involved. And actually the, the bullying regulations do say you should document your analysis. So the next question asks us to speak to peer to staff sexual harassment and what you should consider. So that's an employment law question. Um, because as an employer, you do have some degree of an obligation to protect your staff from sexual harassment, regardless of where the sexual harassment is coming from. Um, so I don't think we, I don't know that we have time or whether it's within sort of the same, uh, under the same category for this webinar, but it's a really good question and we're happy to yeah, we're talk about it from an employment perspective offline. Yeah, and, th and that's what I was going to say is that offline would probably be better for this um, uh, because it also impacts how discipline may, you know, there are a lot of things, but, but it, it actually is not quite the same as peer to peer. Right, right. I don't know if there are any others. Oh, like there are. <laughs> okay. Are there any examples of checklists available? So we've put together a bullying checklist that we've used and tailored for certain schools that we're happy to do for your individual schools. Um, IEP checklist, I actually don't think we've put one together in the past, but we've certainly walked through the steps several times, so we're happy to help you put one yeah. together. And, and I'm going to add um, a reason why I wanted to talk about that is I do feel that the standard IEP forms don't address this appropriately and that I, you know, when we say that this is a good action item, we really mean it's a good action item. <laughs> Okay. I think there are more. Okay. Student to staff. Yeah, no, oh, we yeah. understood that. Yep. That uh, and again, better to do offline, I think. 
All right, we had an incident where a student on the autism spectrum said really derogatory statements about another student outside of school. We are a SPED school and both students attend here. The victim is claiming that she is uh, that she was bullied. What are the responsibilities of the school? So one thing I'll say that the question of hostile environment um, does allow consideration of what happens outside the school. That's part of the bullying statute. Um, I think that's what you need to consider as to what effect is it, in, in, to what extent is it affecting this environment. Right, and I think, so I think you're asking whether, so in this case, none of your students were bullied. Your students were in fact oh. bullying another school's student. I think, I think that's. Oh, I'm, I guess I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. The, re the bullying statute addresses the opposite, where an, a student from another school bullies one of your students, in which case there's a separate notice obligation to notify the school of the other student. Right. Um, but and it doesn't really address this situation where your students are doing the bullying. To a, a, a child in a different school. That's right. right. All right. Um, I think we are, we've only got a few more minutes um, so we're going to wrap it up with one or two more questions. And then we will try to follow up with a, um, a post-webinar, um, the client alert, that talks about um, both those questions that we've touched on now, because I know we're sort of rushed and trying to, to, to respond on the fly, and also the ones we are, we're not getting to. Um, hearing and access to the investigation report before the hearing. Do both parties get to do this in advance of the disciplinary hearing? So um, I guess the answer depends on what the nature of the discipline is. If it uh, falls under the purview of Title IX, so if it's sexual harassment or assault, then both students do in fact have access to this. If it's not sexual in nature and it's it's not under the purview of Title IX, then the Massachusetts student discipline regulations apply, um, and students have different rights of access to documents depending on whether you're considering a short or a long-term suspension. Um, and we would suggest our, our prior webinars on just regular student discipline uh, procedures would address this in more detail. All right, uh, should we do the last? Last question. Sure. Um, particularly when these interactions happen outside of school and nothing has happened in school. So again, one of the things that the bullying statute asks you to do is to look at how the school environment is impacted. Yep. We might have. So we have one more minute. We might have okay. time for one more. Um, different investigator and adjudicatory. Okay. So the question is addressing our point that you should have a different investigator and a different adjudicator. Does the this apply to any disciplinary offense or just in harassment discrimination situations? I think it applies to all. I think it's really, I mean, I don't think it's a requirement that you do it in other situations, but as a measure of best practice, I think it makes a lot of sense to have somebody investigate the facts being a different person than the, the person who's actually going to determine whether the misconduct occurred and whether discipline is warranted. Um, but we do recognize, uh, and we've had this conversation with schools, that, that uh, you know, you have the staff that you have and that schools often also want to have somebody who is completely separate from both the investigative side and the disciplinary side to act as whatever you want to call it, the guidance counselor or the dean of students or whatever, to have interactions that are neither investigative or disciplinary yeah. with the student. And um, I, so again, some of this is recommended rather right. than absolutely right. yeah. required. Yeah, the role of the investigator is to collect the facts and present the facts to the final adjudicator, and then the adjudicator determines whether the student engaged in misconduct. All right, so this brings us to the end. Um, we know that many people have other things that uh, they need to head out to, and, and like I said, we'll follow up with a client alert, and feel free to get in touch with us by phone. I think the, uh, the last page of the, the webinar has our phone numbers and email addresses. Thanks, so everyone. thank you so much.